first of all, thank you for having um, a number of missions at this uh, meeting. And um, my presentation is going to be a little different, where I'm not getting into the markers, or I'm not getting into the QTLs or the research, but looking at crop improvement or overall research agenda as a whole when we're talking about innovation labs. So um, going on, um, my presentation is going to look at some of the game-changing technologies that we have discussed and we are, we are discussing over the next couple of days. Some scaling up plans and constraints, how do we link it with nutrition, and definitely um, more stress on research and policy priorities. Now, to, uh, just to begin this uh, presentation, um, I would like to uh, just take a few, uh, few minutes to just think, when we are de deciding the research agenda, when we are looking at different innovation lab, what we are sometimes losing sight is that we get so much uh, pulled into how we are going to do the research than when we really address why are we there into. Because we, so we get lost into how are we going to address this research and what are the results, whereas we lose the real objective of the research, which is primarily to achieve developmental ob objectives, to be able to reach the food security outcomes that we, that whole research was primarily set to do. So um, some of the uh, game-changing technologies that we are looking at in current scenario and which we see and which we at USA at India are, are looking at, which we are supporting more in terms of transfer of these innovations, sharing of these innovations across the globe. One of them is the next generation genomics, where we are looking at a number of these marker technologies. We are looking at genomics. We are looking at these QTLs, and which number of my uh, colleagues have here discussed in much more detail. But when we really discuss this, what is the what is the real objective of the research is to get the, the products out in the for the farmers because eventually. What we are designing, whether we are designing as crops, we are the designing of like, you know, uh, the farmer is the one who's going to be the ulterior benefit, who's going to benefit out of these research projects. And these questions need to be addressed upfront. How much time are we going to spend in developing these research agenda? Because research is something that we are investing in today to have the products out of the farmer's field in as, in as quick as possible. And in doing that, sometimes, and in, in I, and I'm not um, different, but when we're looking at the scientist community, we are not very good at communicating. Scientists are very good at putting up papers and putting up manuscripts, but first of all, we have to take a step back and see what are we doing to address the developmental challenges through the research agenda that we are really projecting. And when we're doing that, how are we communicating over the time period? We while manuscripts are important, but at the same time, what are we achieving in terms of research has to get into the hands of the public as well. And we are looking at climate resilient, water saving crops, climate resilient crops, and um, my Kulvet, Kulvet and Zaidi have actually presented a lot of uh, uh, technologies on, so on wheat and on maize, and we have a number of innovation labs who are uh, looking at sorghum and millet. And why is climate resilient crops important in current scenario is not because that it is going to be something that in 20 years. We are facing climate change and its effects today, which is only going to get worse as the years are going to come. And who's the most affected is not the guys who are or like, you know, the public sector research, they're making the agenda, this is the national action plan, this is the plan to address the climate change. But the farmer who's really facing it today, who's only going to get worse and worse tomorrow, and eventually he may decide to go out of agriculture as a whole, because if it's not profitable, he will not stick to it. So the agenda for research has to be driven by who is the ulterior benefit of, the, uh, of our research. And I would also like to uh, focus on the role of biotechnology, which is many a times misunderstood. We are not looking at bringing up, like, you know, the, uh, the there has to be a whole science-based approach. It should not be provably dr driven by, okay, there is, there is a whole lot of people who are talking about genetically modified crops or, like, you know, conventional breeding. But we have done selection or genetic selection for the last more than 5,000 years. Humans have done that all through the time, and that is why we have varieties, we have improved crops. 
So if we are looking at a science-based approach, that is something that we have to really consider, that how quickly can we really address the challenges that are facing in food and nutritional security, and being able to do that with adequate resources in the given time frame. The focus and the future of crop improvement, where we are looking at tailor-made crops, we are looking at interlinking of the climate data, interlinking of GIS-based systems with the crop improvement, that is something that we are looking at in future. And when we are looking at scaling up plants, like when, with Richard's presentation yesterday, we have to scale, put these questions up front. What are we as individuals looking at? When, who is going to scale it up? When is it going to scale up? And who is going to drive the scaling up? As we said, we are looking at the tipping point that when it really goes for spontaneous adoption. And how are we going to achieve that tipping point is very important because that is what is going to drive the research agenda that you're really put investing your resources today. We have to clarify the role of NARS, and I'll come into that, I'll get into more detail in a little bit later, whereas, and the other two I've already covered in terms of genomics, conventional breeding, and integration of crop and weather forecasting. Now, as I mentioned, the role of research versus NAS and in terms of public versus private investment. There is a place for both public as well as private sector investment. But one has to say that it has to complement each other. But at the same time, we cannot do away with open pollinated varieties or we cannot do away with hybrids. Both have a space in today's today's era because both need to go hand in hand. It is not something that you're just looking at private sector research, let's drive this whole agenda with the private sector, but we also need the public sector. So it's the partnership that we are looking at. And the other important constraint is definitely the policy environment. What policy environment are we looking at at this current, current scenario? Is it something that really will take up the product that comes out of our research, our innovations, which will be taken up by the which has an enabling environment to really being scaled up. Is it something that we're considering that if we are looking at developing, for instance, a you know, high yielding variety of maize or wheat, which is tolerant to heat stress, which is tolerant to drought stress, is it something that the policy really enables us to scale it up in, no, in, in a very short period of time? If the policy environment is not conducive, it may take you ages. So the en entire research is just what it is ends up is sitting on the shelf and not being utilized in the, for, for the end users. And the other aspect, which um, I know many of you have really, I, like I have discussed in much more detail, is the intellectual property rights and biodiversity. With more and more private sector really re in, uh, investing their resources into research, Will they be willing to share the research that they have done by investing their own resources versus when it comes to public sector investment, which is for public good? So we need to strike a balance that where are we looking at these IPRs? Where are we looking at this biodiversity, particularly when we are looking at sharing of these resources cross-border? Because this will, has started cropping up in number of our activities, but this is something that we need to consider upfront. We need to make sure that we are addressing the issues upfront because once you have a product and then you're looking at addressing these challenges is not something that's very, that's, that's the best case scenario because what if it is not taking, taking up from there, it's just gonna sit at the shelf. And uh, in terms of the nutrition linkages, we are looking at um, pulses research and like what Dave has said, that these are nutrition rich crops, these are primarily cultivated by women farmers and eventually when these nutrition dense crops are really taken up by the women and the, uh, like the women in the family and really being utilized, particularly in countries like India which is primarily vegetarian, the overall nutritional status of the family goes up. So we should encourage more investment, more research into how to incorporate the interlinkages of having that between our staple crop systems. And also, we in the past we mentioned about orphan crops, but frankly these are not orphan crops. These are nutri-dense cereals and nutri-dense crops, and we should focus on how do we integrate those in between our cereal systems. And finally, um, when we're talking about research and policy priorities and taking uh, up from the presentation that uh, Bahiru gave yesterday, we look at the scale at which the nutrition and the food security indicators are in South Asia. 
which are sometimes in some regions they are worse in sub sub-Saharan Africa. And looking at the dense populate, population, it's highly likely that we will be able to achieve scale in doing work with both public and private sector to, to really move the needle on developmental challenges if we are able to achieve even marginal improvements in crop productivity in nutritional status. And in doing that, what we as USAID India are looking at is sharing of the technology, sharing of the innovations, and to again put in terms of our, like, you know, the science, technology, innovation, and partnership, which is our overall agenda of USAID, we don't want that science and technology and innovation and partnership ends up only into research. It needs to drive research to reach developmental outcomes. So with that, I'd like to end. Thank you. Thank you, Shivani. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.